Well, welcome again to the Anglican Diocese of Melbourne uh, service for this week, the Sunday after Trinity, or the third Sunday of Pentecost. Uh, again, we're at St. David's Moorabbin, uh, and the service leader and uh, president for uh, the service is the Reverend Santa Pakinatan, uh, who's the area dean of Monash Kingston and the vicar of St. Michael's and St. Luke's in North Dandenong. Uh, please uh, enjoy and take part in the service as much as you're able to do. Pray that God will speak to you, encourage you, challenge you, and build you up in your Christian faith and walk. Uh, we're going to sing our first hymn now. The sentence for today. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Ask therefore the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is God's kingdom, now and forever. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Commandments. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Jesus said, this is the great and first commandment and the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Together we say the Kyrie Eleison. Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. Please stand as we say the Gloria together. 
Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Collect for the Second Sunday after Pentecost. All-powerful God, in Jesus Christ, you turn death into life and defeat into victory. Increase our faith and trust in him, that we may triumph over evil. In the strength of the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated, and we shall now have the Bible readings for today. The first reading is taken from the book of Exodus, chapter 19, beginning at verse 2. After they set out from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai and camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So Moses went back and summoned the elders of the people and set before them all the words the Lord had commanded him to speak. The people all responded together. We will do everything the Lord has said. So Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. The second reading is from Romans, chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have the peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into the grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, and hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Through, for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love to us in this. 
while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wharf through him? For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, who, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Hear the word of the Lord. Please stand for the gospel. The Lord be with you. The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew chapter 9, commencing at the 35th verse. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 9, from verse 35. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and illness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and illness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal those who are ill, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Hear the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Well, let's pray as we come to God's word. Gracious God, speak to us from your word. Shine its light in our hearts. and Stir us up to live for the glory of Jesus. Amen. We are so used to pictures that stir our hearts to compassion. The pictures of grief at police brutality and the compassion that we then feel at the victim uh, and their family and others. Pictures of grief at funerals, pictures of refugees on Manus Island or wherever, or those in boats or in detention, or pictures of beggars on the frosty Melbourne streets this winter. Or it may not be pictures so much as the letters we receive by email or in the post asking for money for particular needs, for health projects in Africa or in the Northern Territory or elsewhere. And they seem to have increased in recent months. Uh, I've been uh, not quite inundated, but certainly many more requests from people I know or people a little bit distant from that who are saying because of this COVID pandemic, 
uh, their diocese, their city, their town, their country is in uh, bigger need than ever before. Or for me, some overseas friends uh, stuck in different countries, uh, jobless, penniless and needing help. Or we've seen people recently suffering from cyclones uh, in the South Pacific. And it's easy to feel overwhelmed and feel exhausted, I think, at all these uh, pictures and stories, accounts of suffering and need. Uh, we want to be compassionate, but sometimes it's compassion fatigue, as they call it. Uh, too much need, too many places, too much suffering. At the beginning of this gospel reading, Jesus feels compassion. But what is striking in this account is that the people in front of him were, let's call it, normal people. Uh, not that those who suffer are abnormal, but these are people in their normal life. They're not destitute, they're not victims of a, a cyclone, or they're not bereaved at a funeral. They are, they are people crowds that Jesus sees. When he sees the crowds, he had compassion on them. These are all through the towns and villages of Galilee in his day, of course. Now, we may not remember what a crowd is like because we live with social distancing, but it's where there are a lot of people gathered together in those former times. There are lots of people here. Jesus has compassion on them. Not because they're starving, or war affected, ordinary people moved with compassion. Uh, literally in the Greek, to be moved with compassion is to be moved in your guts or bowels. It's not quite such a pleasant picture, but that's where in the ancient world they thought your compassion derived from. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. We might be stirred to compassion when we see people in big need but what about when we just see people in the street, the people in the shopping malls, the people who are just doing their normal life in our city? They were harassed and helpless like a sheep without a shepherd. See, Jesus' compassion here is, let's call it, spiritually based. These sheep, sheep are defenseless animals, of course, needing to be fed and needing to be protected. They're vulnerable. And Jesus, in his guts or bowels even, yearns with compassion for them. They're leaderless or at least misled by their leaders. They're uncared for spiritually. They're unprotected. The sheep without a shepherd was an image that comes out of the Old Testament, both the good shepherd, the Lord's my shepherd, but also the shepherd less or the bad shepherds of the people of Israel in, say, the prophet Ezekiel. So here in What's stirring Jesus would be an implicit rebuke or criticism of the Jewish leaders of his day who have not led them in the truth of the good news of God, but have led them into slavery to their laws over and above the Old Testament laws themselves. So what, what moves Jesus with compassion here are people in need of hearing the good news of the kingdom, not people who are in dire poverty or other predicaments, but people simply who need to hear the good news because their teachers, their Pharisees or their scribes or their rabbis have not led them in the truth from what we call the Old Testament. In other parts of the Gospels, Jesus rebukes such leaders for not seeing in what we call the Old Testament that it speaks of Jesus himself. And so Jesus is moved with compassion because here are helpless, defenseless people who have failed to be taught the good news of the kingdom and therefore the good news of the Messiah of the kingdom, Jesus himself. We ought to be moved with compassion for physical need. We ought to strengthen ourselves not to succumb to compassion fatigue. The need of compassion is overwhelming not least this year, I think. But what about ordinary people? The people we see down the street, our neighbours, our work colleagues, the people we pass in the shopping malls or whatever, the people we stand 1.5 metres from when we're in some queue. Are we moved with compassion for their spiritual need? 
See, what this little vignette is saying to us is that we ought to see people with gospel lens. We ought to see people as Jesus sees people, to have his perspective on people, not to look at people and say, oh, they've got a very pleasant life, they've got a nice house and a nice car, things are going well with them. But rather to see the, the primary need of humanity is the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. So do we see a successful business person in need of the gospel? Are we filled with compassion for such a person? Or where we see, perhaps even just beginning now, happy sports fans, when their team might have won now that they've started playing again. But do we see them not as happy, but as in desperate need of the gospel of Jesus? Or as we pass by the shoppers whose trolleys are overflowing with pasta, flour and toilet rolls, do we see them as people who need the gospel and therefore we are filled with compassion. Notice that, that for us Christians it's to be filled not with self-righteousness, not to look down on people, but to be filled with compassion for them because of their need. See, Jesus saw the world as fundamentally lost. That's in effect what this passage is speaking to us. He says to the disciples at the end of this passage, go out to the lost sheep of Israel. And he's not saying particularly that there are a few lost ones here or there, but in general, they need Jesus, as does our world in general, of course, need Jesus. Jesus' own ministry of teaching and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and illness in the first verse of this reading shows that he is the true shepherd that is the true Messiah. He does what the Old Testament yearned for, the one who would be the shepherd of God's people, who would teach and heal and so on. Without Jesus, people are lost. It's why our diocese's motto, if you like, is to make the word of God fully known so that all people, anywhere they come from, whatever language or ethnicity they've come from, whatever socioeconomic background they have, their gender or anything else about them, it doesn't matter. They need Jesus. And we, with compassion, need to make the word of God fully known. But notice, too, that this compassion drives to prayer. He said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest. That is, pray. The Lord of the harvest, of course, is God. Pray to, that, that God may, the Lord of the harvest may, send out workers into his harvest field. Compassion ought to drive us to prayer. Now, that's a caution, I think, for many of us. So often when I see a need, I think, well, what program, what thing can I do? By nature, I'm perhaps an activist, as many would be. But moved with compassion, where to pray. And it's not saying do nothing but pray, that is only pray, but rather it's saying do nothing without praying. Prayer should take a priority here because it's the Lord of the harvest to whom we pray. So pray to the Lord of the harvest, petition him, ask him, beseech him, plead with him, for laborers. That is, it's God's work to bring in the harvest. It's God's work, therefore, to raise up the harvesters and ask with a sense here of urgency and persistence. Both of those ideas are there. Now, when we read this verse, and, and when I've heard this passage preached over the years, it's usually applied in the terms of overseas mission. That is, let's send laborers out into the deepest, darkest jungles of Africa or somewhere like that. But actually, the labor is a few anywhere and everywhere. I doubt that there's one single place on earth where there are too many laborers for the gospel. Yes, in deepest, darkest Africa, China, Middle East, and so on, laborers are needed. But so too in Melbourne and Geelong, in our diocese. So too we need laborers, not only people to be ordained to preach and teach and care for God's people in parishes, though we certainly need more than who, those we uh, currently have year by year, but also those who will labor for the sake of 
training children or youth, teaching Sunday school, running playgroups, sharing the gospel with friends, colleagues, neighbours and family. In this secular country of ours, too often, sadly, I think, we, we do not come to prayer as urgently as we ought. And Jesus is wanting to drive us to pray, pray for God to raise up the harvesters. But there is a danger in such praying, because straight after urging them to pray, Jesus called those disciples and sent them in verse 5. Pray for God to raise up harvesters, out you go. God sends you. It's a dangerous prayer. I remember preaching on this passage some years ago now, and it changed my life preparing for this, because I felt compelled that God was speaking to me as I preached, maybe more than normal. And a couple of years later, I was overseas with CMS in mission work throughout Asia. I hadn't expected that when I started to prepare preaching from this passage. It's a dangerous passage to read, preach from, and I think to listen to. Are you praying that God gives you the eyes to see our world with gospel lens? Are you praying that God will help you see the harvest that are, that are white and ready for harvest? Or are you seeing closed doors and hostility in this secular country of ours in Australia? Are you praying for labourers for our parishes in Melbourne, for chaplaincies in hospitals and prisons and schools for that matter? Are you praying for labourers to bring the gospel to the university, to overseas students, to migrants, to refugees and beyond our boundaries as well? And if you are, be prepared that, that you might be part of the answer, that Jesus may then call you to go to share the gospel, the good news of Jesus, with some community, with someone, somewhere. This passage of scripture is quite challenging, I think. Challenging for us to, to, to think, how do we view our world? Challenging to us to stir us to compassion as we see our world in general. Challenging us to pray and challenging us to be bearers of the good news of Jesus, to make the word of God fully known. Let's pray. God, our Father, we pray that you will indeed raise up more laborers for the harvest within our diocese, within our state and country, indeed globally within our world, that people everywhere may come to know Jesus as Lord and Saviour and Good Shepherd. Amen. As we stand, let us affirm the faith of the church by saying together the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified unto Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. 
We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church, for the world and for the church. And today the prayers are going to be led by Reverend Johnson David, the vicar of this parish. Almighty and ever-living God, we are taught by your holy word to make prayers and supplications and to give thanks for all people. We ask you in your mercy to receive our prayers, which we offer to your divine majesty. Heavenly Father, we bring to you the nations of the world, especially, Lord, the racial tensions that is coming from America and, and bringing awareness for, to the rest of the world. We pray for peace, understanding, and a path forward for all to learn and move together. We pray that you will lead the nations of the world, the ways of righteousness and peace, and guide their rulers in wisdom and justice for the tranquility and good of all. Bless especially our Prime Minister, Cabinet Ministers, and every elected member of the Parliament who exercise authority in this land. Grant that they may impartially administer justice, restrain wickedness and vice, and uphold integrity and truth. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for the church, the universal church. Heavenly Father, we bring to you, O Lord, the state of the church during these pandemic times. And even as we move forward, gradually moving out of these lockdowns and quarantines, we pray that you will teach us how to continue to be relevant to our communities. We beseech you to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord, and grant that all who confess your holy name may agree in the truth of your holy word and live in unity and godly love. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for the leaders of our diocese, we pray for our archbishop, our bishops, all archdeacons, area deans, clergy, church lay leaders, wardens, parish council members, and all our parishioners. Give grace, Heavenly Father, to all our leaders, that by their life and doctrine they may set forth your true life-giving word and rightly and duly administer your holy sacraments. And to all your people, give your heavenly grace, and especially to this congregation here present, that they may receive your word with meek hearts and due reverence, and serve you in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. Lord, in your mercy. We ask you of your goodness, Lord, to comfort and sustain all who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. We remember John Register from St. David's this morning. We also bless your holy name for all your servants who have died in the faith of Christ. Give us grace to follow their good examples that with them we may be partakers of your heavenly kingdom. Grant this, Father, through Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Jesus said, Come to me, all who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus said, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another even as I have loved you. Let us pray together the prayer of approach found in your booklet. We do not presume to come to your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, 
so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy, welcoming sinners and inviting them to the Lord's table. Let us therefore confess our sins in penitence and faith, confident in God's forgiveness. Merciful God, our maker and our judge, we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, and in what we have failed to do. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We repent and are sorry for all our sins. Father, forgive us, strengthen us to love and obey you in newness of life through Jesus Christ. Almighty God, who has promised forgiveness to all who turn to him in faith, pardon you and set you free from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As we come to the greeting of peace, let me encourage you to pray for or message or ring uh, people that uh, you may normally exchange a greeting of peace with but are unable to today. We are the body of Christ. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have these gifts to share. Accept and use our offerings for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. Blessed be God forever. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. All glory and honor be yours always and everywhere, mighty creator, ever-living God. We give you thanks and praise for our Savior, Jesus Christ, who by the power of your spirit was born of Mary and lived as one of us. By his death on the cross and rising to new life, he offered the one true sacrifice for sin and obtained an eternal deliverance for his people. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Merciful God, we thank you for this gift of your creation, this bread and wine. And we pray that by your word and Holy Spirit, we who eat and drink them may be partakers of Christ's body and blood. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. And when he had given you thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup and again giving you thanks, he gave it to his disciples saying, drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Christ has died, Christ is risen, 
Christ will come again. Therefore we do as our Saviour has commanded, proclaiming his offering of himself, made once for all upon the cross, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming again, we celebrate with this bread and this cup his one perfect and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Renew us by your Holy Spirit, unite us in the body of your Son, and bring us with all your people into the joy of your eternal kingdom, through Jesus Christ our Lord, in whom and in whom, in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, we worship you, Father, in songs of never-ending praise. Blessing and honour and glory and power for yours forever and ever. Amen. As our Saviour Christ has taught us, we are confident to pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. We who are many are one body, for we all share in the one bread. The gifts of God for the people of God, come let us take this holy sacrament of the body and blood of Christ in remembrance that he died for us and feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
bountiful God, at this table you graciously feed us with the bread of life and the cup of eternal salvation. May we who have reached out our hands to receive the sacrament be strengthened in your service. We who sung your praises tell of your glory and truth in our lives. We who have seen the greatness of your love see you face to face in your kingdom and come to worship you with all your saints forever. Together, Father, we offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. We sing our second hymn for today, Have Faith in God, My Heart. Peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you, now and always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and to serve the Lord.